got your message notes. I want to share just a few minutes. I'm cognizant of the time. I'll get you out of here in about 20 minutes. But I want to leave us with a word moving forward in our celebration. Uh, really, for us, I believe God gives me themes for a year. We've done this really since the beginning. Uh, there's a word that the Lord just keeps putting in my spirit. And I feel like as a church, it's our responsibility to grab what God is speaking to us, not only corporately, but how many know individually. And that we have a season and an opportunity. Of course, this can happen at any time. But it's really something I believe God has called me to release in your life specifically. And so I want to share just a minute about that theme and lay a foundation this week. I'm going to speak over the next three weeks about this theme and helping us to experience it in our life. Because really, it's not good just to have a word. That word has to be saturated in our life. It can't just be something we say out loud occasionally. But really, we want it to inter intertwine in our personal lives. We want it to intertwine in our spiritual lives, in our families, in our finances. Really, every area of our life, at work, in the grocery store. I mean, whatever area of your life, we really are praying, God, let me experience this at the highest level. And our one word this year that I feel God is calling us to focus on is breakthrough. Breakthrough. Everybody say breakthrough. breakthrough. Say it again. Say breakthrough. <clears throat> now, breakthrough is an act or an instance of moving beyond or through an obstacle. Moving beyond or through an obstacle. Here's the question. Has anybody ever had an obstacle in your life? Has anybody ever had a point in your life where you felt stuck? Where maybe you felt there was a barrier. You couldn't put your finger on it. Didn't really know how to do it. But there was a limitation in your life. There may be four great areas going on in your life. But this fifth one, you have struggled your entire life. Maybe you've been struggling with it for years. I don't, I don't know what it is, but there's this moment in my life where I recognize that there is a real barrier that I've got to break through. I've got to break through. I need, God, I need you to break through in this area of my life. And really, when you look at the word breakthrough, it's a military word. It's a military concept. And it's where one army is able to weaken another army to the point of collapse, and so when they say breakthrough, that's where that army breaks through and invades enemy territory. So there's a barrier, and for whatever reason, in that moment, that army can break past the barrier and take that territory away from the enemy. Now, how many look at our lives and realize that the devil has territory in our lives at moments? So you could be born again, and yet he still holds an area of your life hostage. It has nothing to do with salvation. You're going to heaven. You love God. It's amazing. But you realize because of the choices of the past and the fact that I was born a sinner, there are areas in my life that the enemy still has control over. And so what I'm talking about breakthrough, it's breaking past that area in our life. See, there's really only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of, of Satan and the devil. Good and evil, darkness and light. You can dress it up into any other name of religion, but the father of it, when you get to the root of it, is the devil. And then there's God and the kingdom of light. Those are the only two oppo opposing forces that are fighting in this earth around us today. Now, the challenge is you don't see these invisible forces. You know, we see each other and you can wrap, you know, the enemy's tactic. You can typically assign a name to it and say they're the enemy. But did you know the devil uses people that it's not them and he even uses good people? And so you can't say they're the enemy. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That it's not them, but there's enemy forces that are using them to advance that agenda. To come against the kingdom of God. Look at Matthew chapter 11 verse 12. I just want to lay a foundation. And from that time it says John the Baptist began preaching until now. The kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. Everybody say forcefully. So we're forcefully advancing. And it says and violent people are attacking it. And so what I believe is the church we're called to do is to go in and to take the enemy's territory. To go in and to fight back, 
fight against the areas that he has dominated, the areas that he has gained control, whether it's in our lives or in the lives of others. There is this spiritual warfare. That's really the, the basis of spiritual warfare. And that's a basic understanding. But you just got to realize the kingdom of darkness is pushing against the kingdom of light. And whoever's winning is forcefully advancing. Whoever's losing is retreating. And there's always this dynamic that's taking place in our life. And so we understand you're engaged in spiritual warfare whether you realize it or not. And so why don't we live our life in such a way that we realize that, look, the kingdom of darkness doesn't want me to gain victory in every area of my life. He can't take your salvation, but he can cause you to walk in defeat. And why is that? That's because as believers, we don't step into the promises that God has for our life. Now, let me just have a caveat right here. I don't want this to get spooky. I don't believe there's a demon around every corner. I don't believe everything that happens is because a demon did it or an angel did it. I think sometimes we make dumb decisions. I think sometimes people are just people and life happens. And so I don't want to walk around looking for demonic forces and looking where the demons are hiding and all this stuff. What I want us to do is recognize that when there is an area in my life where I'm stuck, I'm going to aggressively attack that area and advance forward. I'm asking God for a breakthrough. I'm asking God for a breakthrough. And I believe Jesus has called us to be the aggressor. Look at the Great Commission. He said, go into all the world. Into, go, go, go. Why? Because the enemy has control of the world. And so everywhere we go, he wants us to go into that world and be salt and light to advance his kingdom. Where you are, there is victory. And so we're not supposed to stay within the four walls of this church. We're not supposed to just sit quietly in our house. You need to go out to the rodeo, Houston Rodeo and Livestock Show. Why? Well, there's so much drinking and debauchery. Yeah, well, why don't we bring some Jesus with us? I mean, why are we retreating back? Go into the places. Look, God ain't scared of the honky-tonks. Now, I'm not telling you to go drink a beer and slap it down and have a... I'm just telling you, go be the salt and light where God has called you. I do believe there are people that are called to go into those places because they have the vision and the resolve, and we cannot judge them. We support them, and we say, we're advancing the kingdom of God. We're, we're advancing it. We can't sit quietly in our homes and in these four walls. Go live life. Go out there. Be loving. Be kind. Tell people about the goodness of God. Share the gospel. Live your life in public. And let's see God glorified and the enemy's kingdom uh, retreat. Now look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 26. We're called to liberate those the devil has taken captive to do his will. It says, then they will come to their senses and escape from whose trap? From the devil. So he's real. Yeah, he's real. He's real. And he has set traps for your loved ones, for your co-workers, for our community. He sets traps for us. It says, for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. They're blinded. They don't even understand. They don't know why they do what they do. And at the root of it, what we've got to understand is there's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of Satan. You just have to understand. And I realize, listen, there's a lot of people in this church, you're a brand new believer. We haven't talked a whole lot about spiritual warfare, but I want you to understand it really exists. That God has called us, and it's nothing to be fearful of. We just, we spend our lives continuing to advance his kingdom, and I believe it's practical. It's in what we say, it's in what we do, and we don't have to be afraid of what the devil is going to do to us. He cannot destroy what God is doing on the inside of us. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. <clears throat> But what we do have to know is that opposition is normal. Opposition is normal. See, opposition always precedes a breakthrough. Uh, the enemy is not happy with what God is doing in your life. And you, you, you're advancing daily. You're, you're moving your life forward. The devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion. He's seeking for someone to devour, and here you are, you're advancing. You're not afraid of him. You've recognized his schemes. You're moving things forward, and we have to understand he's not happy with you. He's not excited that you came to Anchor Bend this morning so that your outlook would be changed and your life pointed closer to the direction of God. 
And it's amazing to me how that as Christians, we become more in love with God. Look, we're praying, we're reading our Bibles, we're inviting people to church, we're serving at the Dream Center, we're serving on the Dream Team, and things are going well. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. You know, the enemy starts to attack. Now, it was good. You gave your life to Christ, which last weekend, I believe it was four people, gave their life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And it's awesome. I want you to know that's an amazing thing when, 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 when you surrender your life to Jesus. But you got to know there is an attack that is going to come. Why? Because he's not happy with you. And so the challenge for me with with Christianity and Christians at times is that they give their life to Christ and then all hell breaks loose and now they're mad at God. You know what I mean? Their marriage starts to go sideways. Their kids are now acting crazier than ever before. Their finances, they started tithing and all of a sudden everything seems to break. They're like, well, God, I thought you said, no, no, baby, he did. Will you stay faithful? Listen, there is an attack. We understand that's normal. And I understand that, God, there is a breakthrough around this corner that seems like the enemy is winning in. And what we have to understand is don't be mad at God. Be excited. Why? Because the devil has overplayed his hand. That when you begin to face opposition, you realize, God, there must be a breakthrough that's about to happen because all the enemy can do is cause you to want to quit. You only lose when you quit. That's how come when you fall seven times, you don't stay down on the seventh. You get back up. You get back up. You keep getting back up. You keep getting back up. Why? Because we know that eventually, even though the enemy attacks us, greater is he that's in me. And God is going to get the victory if I'll push through to a breakthrough. Breakthrough. Look, John 4, 4 says, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. You've got to believe that God wants me to experience a breakthrough. Look, say me. God wants me to experience a breakthrough. He does. He doesn't want you to live your life stuck. But you've got to believe this. You've got to know that God wants you to experience it. John 10, 10 says that I came that you may enjoy life. You shouldn't live your whole life frustrated. You shouldn't live your whole life thinking, God, never, God would never. No, no, there has to be a point where you get to the place where you say, man, I'm enjoying life. Look, it says, look at at what it is, and have it in abundance. What? Life in abundance. I'm going to enjoy it in abundance to the full till it overflows. That word there is parisos. Look at what that word means. It means super abundant in quantity, superior in quality. That's the way God wants your life to be, exceeding, abundantly above, more abundantly, very highly, beyond measure, more. Now, how many have got an area in your life that you're not experiencing that? That's an area that we're going to pinpoint this year and say, God, you're going to give me a breakthrough. The only way you can experience that in every area is for God to break through in every area of your life. God, I believe it. I know you want me to experience that. And I want to share three things quickly this morning that you need to know if you're going to experience breakthrough in 2018. And it comes out of an interesting story. God gave me this story to begin to study a couple of months ago. It's been in my heart, and I want to share this story, and then we're going to pull some truths out of it. It's the story found in the New Testament. It's in Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 7. Now, this is an interaction where Jesus has with his disciples. He has it twice. I know you can read the story in the different gospels and think it's the same story. It's not. Two different times. It's at the beginning of his encounter with the disciples, and it's at the end of his encounter with the disciples. So two separate times. I want to focus on the first one, uh, and I believe it's going to help set us up for breakthrough in our lives. Now, Jesus here has been preaching on the shore of Galilee. Crowds are gathering, they're pressing him in, and he's preaching the gospel and the good news. And there's two boats on the shore. I'm setting it up before we dive in. Two boats are on the shore, and one of them is Simon Peter's. And so Jesus goes over and he says, look, I'm going to step into this boat. And Simon Peter's like, sure, that's fine, step into my boat. They push off from the shore, and Jesus is preaching from the shore so that the crowds don't press him in. And that's where we pick up the story. Look at this. 
When he had finished speaking, so he's sharing the gospel, he's preaching to the crowds of people. He turns and he says to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let your nets down to catch some fish. Now you got to know that Simon Peter was a fisherman. This is his boat. This is what he's done his entire life. This is his craft. This is his career. And look at what he says. Master, Simon replied, we worked all night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, everybody say but. So, but if you say so, I'll let the net down again. And this time their nets, so he lets the net down. It says, this time their nets were so full of fish, the nets began to tear. A shout for help brought partners in the other boat close by. And then soon the boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. How many know that's a breakthrough? You're not catching anything. And then all of a sudden you bring in so many fish, your boat is about to sink. And what I want us to know and pick up first from this story is that Jesus cares about your day-to-day life. So here you have Simon Peter. He's checking out Jesus. He's not a disciple at this moment. He becomes a disciple right after this. He's watching Jesus. He had known about Jesus, had seen Jesus heal people, perform miracles. Jesus now asked him to step into his life. I want to step into your life. Why? Because that boat represented everything Simon had in his life. Jesus said, I want to step into your life. I want to become a part of your life. And so here we have, Peter says, that's cool. It's awesome. I'm going to have this rabbi who is performing miracles come and jump into the boat. Now, most of us would have thought, well, Jesus would have preached to the masses and then he would have got, okay, hey, take me back to the shore. Things are going well. The, the crowds are doing amazing. I'm going to go out and heal some people. But that's not what he does. Though there are thousands of people making a demand on him and his anointing to heal them, to bring deliverance, Jesus pauses right in the middle of the crusade. Can you imagine? It would be like me pausing in the middle of a sermon. It's almost as if Jesus pauses and says, I love the crowds. I love the people. But I always bring it down to the one. That I'm going to take a moment and Simon, you are so important to me. I want to help you experience breakthrough where there was drought, where there was not enough, where you didn't have what you needed to provide because that's how they provided. Jesus now breaks into his life, his personal life, wasn't ministry life, wasn't about go heal the sick, raise the dead, do the things that are kingdom related in spiritual things. Now he's relating to him in the natural things. Your income your vocation, the thing that you care the most about. See, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And you got to know that Jesus cares about your life. And it's the little things, it's the personal things. It's not just when you come to church that Jesus loves you and is proud of you. He loves you at all times. He cares about every area. He cares about the little things that nobody else thinks he cares about. Jesus cares about you. I mean... But think about it, Peter would have been frustrated because it's almost a rhetorical like, Pfft. I mean, I've been working all night. I've been doing this thing all night, Jesus. I mean, has anybody ever worked hard for something and you feel like you're going nowhere? I mean, think about this. Maybe you're working on your marriage and you're like, look, pastor, come on, pastor. We done got in a marriage small group. I'm going to see a counselor. We're in a marriage counseling. You know, it was hard enough for me to get there. I'm reading books. I'm doing everything they say. I'm working hard to make this work. And it's not getting better. It's getting, you're in good company because that's how Peter felt. But what did Peter need? He needed a a breakthrough. So what's my point? Listen, you're ripe for a breakthrough in your life. You're right in position. And the problem is that's where most people quit. Well, that small group didn't work. That counseling's not working. That book's not working. I'm trying all these things. No, baby. You're positioned for a breakthrough if you can just hold on. Don't quit. Maybe it's your finances. You started that financial peace small group that everybody been talking about. You set yourself on a budget just to see how bad you blow the budget. You're trying to pay off credit cards, and it's getting worse, and it's not better, and and it seems like nothing you do helps. You're in good company. That's how Peter felt. You're setting yourself up for a breakthrough. 
I mean, think about just your job or your business. You're serving your boss. You're maybe got employees, and you're like, I'm giving, and I'm doing all that I can. In fact, we even pray before work. They're not getting better. They're getting worse. I'm trying to bring God into this environment. Now I'm being persecuted. They at least used to like me, but now they know I'm a Christian. I want you to know that is the point that's right before the breakthrough. And if you will keep pushing on, if you will stay fast, I promise you God's going to bring revival in your work, in your business, in your job. Why? Because breakthrough is coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So if you're frustrated, it's okay. If you feel like all your hard work is not producing, I want you to know that's what I believe God is saying this year. This is the year of breakthrough. That's where you got to grab a hold. I, I would put it, we'll put it up in my office this year. Why? Because every obstacle, I'm believing that God is going to break through that obstacle where it has seemed impossible, where we have worked so hard, where we have labored and seen no results. This is the year we're going to see results. Jesus got involved in his life. The second thing we've got to know from this story is that breakthrough is closer than I know. So look in verse 4, it said, And he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper and let your nets down to catch some fish. Look, Peter didn't have to go to a different body of water. He didn't have to go to the the River Jordan. He didn't have to go to the Red Sea. He didn't have to go to the the, the, uh, Mediterranean coast. Breakthrough was just a few yards from where he was. And I want you to know this. I believe God really is speaking to each and every one of you. Breakthrough is not in some different environment. It is closer than you realize. That if you'll just stay faithful with what he has said, stay faithful in doing the thing he's called you to do, it is closer than you know. I remember when we bought the Dream Center campus, we talked a little bit about it earlier. We were not looking for a Dream Center campus. We were looking for a primary place of worship. We found a piece of property, 23 acres, just a couple of years old, and we're thinking, God really spoke to me in the second year for us to position ourselves to purchase property. I felt the Lord really say, you're going to buy some property. So, of course, we're thinking we need a permanent location. Who buys a secondary location before you have a first one, right? So I'm thinking, God, we're going to buy this place, and we put an offer on it. And In the meantime, while we're really stretching our faith towards this piece of property, I'm officing out of Second Baptist Church. The pastor there, Pastor Paul Lewis, he still has church there. He's having church there right now with his his congregation. We let him use it there on Sunday mornings. And I'll never forget, he calls me. It's it's a Tuesday afternoon, and he said, Hey, I'm Paul Lewis. I'm pastor at Second Baptist. We, We may be looking to sell this property, and I thought maybe you could come, and it might be something you're interested in. Well, we talked through it. That's not feasible for our church. But I said, Hey, I could use an office. I'm officing out of my house. Phyllis was homeschooling. How many you know that can be a train wreck? My kids are like, Dad. I'm like, I can't even think straight. My office, they just looked at. They're mad at mom. They're coming to the principal. I mean, you know what I mean? It just wasn't a good setup. I'm like, listen, your mom is an angel. I will beat you. So do whatever she says. I'm just saying. <laughs> Needless to say, I was looking for an office. And uh, he had 1,200 square feet in the back. And it was five, he said, for 500 a month, I'll let you borrow it. I'm like, 500 months about all, I mean, back then, I'm like, $500 a month. Okay, let's do it. I got to have some sanity. And so we got in the back, and Joanna, remember, she, you remember the back? It was so, it was awesome. It was a small beginning. And so we, I wouldn't even meet anybody there. I would only meet them at Starbucks. I went back there. But my point is, here we are, we're in this property, we're stretching our faith towards another one, we're asking God for breakthrough, God bring us land, you have identified land, you've called us to be landowners, we believe this is what you're saying, and the whole time, the breakthrough I was sitting in as an office, stretching my faith towards another piece of property, it's closer than you think. It's closer than you think. I don't know where your breakthrough is or what you're walking through, but if we would open our eyes, I remember just that door shutting. The same day that door shut, this door opened up at Second Baptist, and I thought, well, God, this must be you. We began to walk through it. Our trustees evaluated it. We looked at the long-term proposition for positioning us for effectiveness here, and we felt the Lord say yes. And to this day, look at the impact the Fort Bend Dream Center is having all over the county that 
that we would never make if it was our primary place. <clears throat> Your breakthrough is closer than you think. And here's the third part. I just, I want you to pull it out. It's this obedience doesn't always make sense. Doesn't always make sense. Look at verse 5. It says, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let my nets down again. So what you have to understand is they've been working all night to catch fish because fish were only in the shallow areas uh, at night. In the day, the fish would move to the deeper areas. And so even if you threw a net out into the deep, you wouldn't catch anything because they were so deep, the nets didn't reach that deep. And so here we have Simon Peter, who is a fisherman. He is, that's his vocation. He was probably raised in that his entire life. He's what you would call a subject matter expert. Like if you're going to go get some fishing tips, you would go ask Simon Peter, hey, how do I fish? How do I make it effective? How do I catch what I need to catch to provide for my family? And here you have Jesus flipping modern wisdom upside down. Here you have Jesus saying, I know what it looks like in the natural, I know, I know, I know, I know, I get it. I'm asking you to do something that is not normal, but you have to understand that God's ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. And when breakthrough comes in our life, obedience doesn't always make sense. He'll ask you to do something and you're like, well, God, you know, I, I kind of have a little bit of knowledge. I ain't got a lot of knowledge in a lot of areas, but I got a little bit of knowledge in this area. And I don't know that that's a great idea which is why you would see him pause. Look, we didn't catch anything. And he says, but if you say so, if you say so, I'm gonna let the nets down. I don't think anything's gonna happen, but, but you know what? I, I love this. You can think one thing and still do the right thing. Look, if you think we don't ever wrestle with our thoughts, I want you to know I wrestle with my thoughts all the time. I'll never forget, I've told this story, especially at the very beginning. We were getting ready to launch the church. It was three months before we launched. It was, you started to see those preview services and we were stretching our faith towards the equipment. Now, I don't know about you. I just, I told God, I said, listen, if you're gonna call us to launch a church, I don't wanna use secondhand equipment that is hand-me-down equipment that is hard to transport. God, we want to do it excellent. We want to do it right. We believe in that. And God, the least you could do is help me with that. Amen? Come on, somebody. I done gave everything else up. Scared to death. Can you at least do this? January comes. We've got about 30, 40 people on the team. God's doing amazing things. We had $1,000 in our bank account. Listen, we were not rich. I was coming out of ministry. We had given everything towards the launch of this church. We needed $25,000. By January 25th, it was somewhere around there. It was 24, 25,000. January 25th, right after my birthday. We had $1,000 in the bank account. Now I'm calling people. I'm begging people. Come on, the vision. You know, I'm going to different churches. And man, it just seemed like the well was dry. I mean, our people were, were giving. But man, I don't know about you, but $25,000, you know, it's a lot now. But back then, it was like a million dollars. But it really was because everything hinged on this equipment. And I never forget the Lord said, I want you to write a check. And he didn't speak audibly. I just, I heard something in my heart say, write a check for $1,000. So I argued with God. I'm like, God, did you know that's the last $1,000? Like, I, in case you missed it, I know you're busy. <laughs> I, just, I just want you, he's, I felt like he said, I know. And I said, okay, well, let me talk to Phyllis because, you know, I'm thinking, well, at least she'll bring reason. Because if she says no, then clearly it's not God because God doesn't work out of disunity. Phyllis, I feel like the Lord is saying to give $1,000. And she said, great. Of course, of course she would say, great. Awesome. No, no, I told her, I think it's the last $1,000. She said, awesome. But we have some payments that are due. She's like, okay, let's do it. Let's trust God. I'm like, all right, let's trust God. We're going to write a check. So we wrote a check. We left the name blank. And uh, I'm scared to death. I got to be honest. We barely had the money. We travel up to Alabama for ARC, which is where they certified us to launch as an ARC church. We're ARC church plan 328. We've launched more than 750 churches together uh, just over the last few years. And so we're number 328. Yeah, it was, I thought I'd get a better response, but that's all right. 750 churches. And I felt like the Lord said, I'm going to show you who to give this to. And I, I totally forgot about it. You know, I put it in my back pocket. We're walking around. 
And uh, I meet this guy named Chris Duncan and his wife, Carrie Duncan. We're just talking. And uh, they are going to launch a church in Sumatra, Indonesia, uh, which is an unreached people group, in a movie theater just like we were launching our church. And I felt like the Lord said, that's your that's, that's the contact. I want you to write the check. So I said, Phyllis, listen, go meet them and, uh, and just see if what you feel. She went and met them. She said, absolutely, that's the couple. So I wrote a check and filled out to their ministry and gave it to them. We prayed over them. And I thought, great, we're broke. <laughs> there you go. Whatever. <laughs> we're just going to borrow that one piece of pipe and drape. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. I'm just telling you, I'm sorry I didn't have more faith. I was a little nervous. And uh, the amazing thing is came back within a week, $25,000 in cash came in. I'm telling you, it's a miracle. Had we not had that come in, we wouldn't have been able to purchase the, the equipment and do what we're called to do. And, I mean, I could tell you story after story after story after story after story. And, and, and that is a financial one, but there are relational ones. And the point is this, it doesn't make sense in the natural Obedience is not always going to make sense. And someone says, well, what if I miss God? Here's my question. What if you don't? What if it is God? Yeah, I think that's why we got people in our lives. That's why I asked my wife. That's why I talked. I remember talking to Steve, too, in that process. He's like, bro, let's do it. I just think if you're surrounded by people that love God, that don't have an agenda, they're all for you. At the end of the day, we don't live in a vacuum. It's harder to miss God than you think. And this is what I found. Even if I missed God trying to do it, he still blesses me. What we can't do is allow ourselves to be paralyzed by the enemy and say, well, that's crazy. It doesn't make sense. I always look, well, if that's okay, that might be God. That might just be what God is doing. And so in this year, as you prepare for a breakthrough, just realize it's not always going to make sense. And this year, I want you to get your hopes up. Breakthrough is coming. I don't know where you need it. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it is your marriage. Maybe it's in an education. Maybe the doors have closed. You've been, and I feel this, someone's been applying to nursing school. Go apply one more time and see what God is going to do. Oh, it's full. No, 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 I know, but this is a different season. It's a different time. God is going to break forth in your life. Listen, that's the kind of opportunities we're asking God for. We're saying, God, okay, where there's been no's, there's going to be a yes. Why? Because God is in the middle of the breakthrough. Breakthrough, breakthrough. And this is the year we're going to dream big, we're going to ask big, and we're going to risk big. God, we're all in. We're all in. You know, even the Dream Center campus, God, help us to launch that campus. God, we're all in. We're going to reach more people than we've ever reached. And I believe it's just the beginning, Anchor Bend. It's just the beginning. Let me do this. Let me pray over us. I hope it's blessed you this morning. And then next week, come back. I'm going to, I got a great message that's going to piggyback off of this. And believe it's going to be a breakthrough year, breakthrough year, breakthrough year. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. God, I thank you for just this moment that you have called us here for. That God, this is a year unlike any other year. I receive what Pastor Jeremy said. That God, when names have been changed, breakthrough has occurred. And God, I thank you for that. We receive it. Lord, we thank you for what you've done over the last five years. And God, help us be ready for what you're going to do over the next lifetime of this church. Thank you for letting us be a part of it. Thank you for letting us see so many lives touched and changed and God we really do celebrate this season we love you we bless you in Jesus name keep your head bowed and your eyes closed I want to always extend an invitation for someone that's here this morning maybe you're here celebrating with us but the truth is you don't know God you don't have a relationship with him you've never surrendered your life fully to him We talk about being born again and those numbers that we were celebrating. You realize you could even come here week after week, but you realize something hasn't changed and been changed on the inside of you. That's where God, in the moment of salvation, in the moment of total surrender, He changes us. The Bible says what was dead now comes alive. And it's an amazing thing. If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, salvation takes place. Why? The power of confession and the power of belief. And that's what this moment's all about, that if that's you in this moment, you say, I'm ready to surrender. 
everything to him in this moment. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I wonder if you'd be bold enough just to raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to, I want to pray that prayer with you this morning. I want to surrender my life to him in this moment. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you just that's you. Just raise your hand high. Act of surrender in this moment. Thank you, Jesus. I see you. Come on. Amazing. Just surrender. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. Church, tell them how proud you are of them. I see your hands. It's amazing. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray this prayer together. Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of all of my sins. Save me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Right now, I receive your grace. Thank you for changing me, transforming me, that I'll never be the same. I surrender in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Come on, worship God this morning.